Welcome to the Trade Up Podcast, Episode 4. I'm Lisa Brandt. John Finan and I wrote the book Trade Up, Why Buy a Job When You Can Start a Career. As founder and owner of Fine and Home Service, John is knowledgeable about skilled trades, the economy, and plenty of other things I'll ask him, including what he thinks of pre-apprenticeships, when it is and isn't worth going to college if you're getting into a trade, how far federal money will go that they're pouring into skilled trades 18 months before an election, and his best advice on how to get a job if you can't get an apprenticeship. How many times in your career, John, have you heard that the government is going to put more money into skilled trades? <laughs> um, whenever there's an election coming up, that's pretty much one of the things that you hear about every industry, and ours is no exception. Or perhaps, and it's been a long time, when unemployment was double digits, the government would uh, would definitely help with that. Well, so now the liberals say, and of course, they're fighting for their lives because an election is coming up. So they're going to put $100 million in programs aimed at attracting students to skilled trades. Let's deal with that one first. Is there an issue with attracting people to skilled trades, do you think? Generally speaking, no. Not from what I've seen in Ontario, that's for sure. There's Because uh, the apprenticeship ratios create a situation where it's very difficult to get an apprenticeship. You want to finish high school and you want to go somewhere, the easiest path is to go to university or college because getting in is simply a matter of filling out a loan application and doing a mirror test. And to get into the skilled trades, the skilled trades where an apprenticeship is required is extremely difficult. The ratios are so tight. Getting in is tough. And, you know, my first thought, Lisa, when you said $100 million, $100 million is a lot of money. I'd love to have that. But there's 40 million of us in the country. So what it's, uh, um, you can't even buy a coffee at Starbucks for the amount of money that equals for every person that's in the country. And if you said, okay, well, it's that's not every person. It's like maybe only a subset of that. It's like maybe a hundred bucks for every eligible student that would be thinking about the trades. It's not really much money, but at the end of the day, I think that money could be used more wisely as an employer. I don't need I don't need an incentive to get more employees. They have fifty million dollars uh, apart from that earmarked to streamline official recognition of foreign credentials with a focus on home construction skills. So. We know that one of the federal government's missions and Ontario is to build all this affordable housing, but there are problems with that. So they're saying if they get foreign workers' credentials recognized, $50 million. So is is that an issue, getting foreign workers' credentials recognized here? You know, I don't know enough about the data to speak clearly about that, except a couple of experiences that I've had. Uh, my very first employee back in the 90s was a Bosnian refugee. He was, you know, what he called himself was an electrician from Bosnia. He and his uh, wife had their first child in a refugee camp uh, somewhere in Germany before they came here. So, I mean, a very difficult, ran away from his house, like literally ran away down the street, he and his wife getting away from neighbors who were shooting at them. So horrible situation, got to this country, super motivated to work hard went through whatever program we had back in the 90s for people to show their qualifications. And the certificate of qualification test is essentially a, a multiple choice exam that should test the broad range of what you know. There's uh, five options. So the worst you can get if you don't know anything is 20%. I think after five times, the highest he got was less than 40%. So he clearly wasn't there. He needed to work in an apprenticeship. So he worked with us for, well, worked with me because it was just he and I for a couple of years, we got in the truck every Monday morning at five, drove down to Windsor, stayed the week, drove back. Had he continued on, he he wanted to be certified and he was only going to do that if he could write the test and get it. He didn't want to do the whole apprenticeship. So he failed. I'm sure that he's not an electrician at this point because unless he did an apprenticeship with somebody else, um, there's just no way he was going to get certified. So that's my experience with it. I don't know to what degree other people are having success. My sense is that the construction industry across the world is completely different in other countries than it is here. So, you know, if you're building a high rise in Canada, my wife and I recently were traveling to Spain, Morocco, Portugal. I saw what were go what was going up there. Yeah, the buildings look kind of the same when they were done, but I watched the process of them getting built and there was nothing like what we do here. So, you know, my first sense is our colleges and universities are full of young men and women that could be out in the trades if they really did take a serious look at it. And I think that uh, they should be the ones that get those first opportunities. 
What exactly is a pre-apprenticeship? Now, I know you need to be an apprentice before you're a journey person. That's about the extent of my knowledge. Um, I have a nephew who's an electrician. But what is a pre-apprenticeship? Yeah, no, that's a great question because I've been seeing an awful lot of advertising from, you know, colleges, private colleges. Some of the unions are running um, signs that say, you know, sign up for a pre-apprenticeship. What I think is it's a it's a false sense of hope that they're selling to a young person to get into the trades and they're taking mom and dad's money for a year or two to give them the illusion that when they're done, they will start an apprenticeship, which is not how it works in Ontario. You need to be indentured to an employer. And the fact that maybe you've done it for a couple of years in a classroom, maybe you've done a little bit of co-op, you're out in the field, does not get you one minute closer to the 9,000 hours of an uh, indentured apprenticeship that you need to do for most trades in Ontario. So, you know, I think it's something that people need to look very carefully at before they, A, waste their time, which I think is more valuable than the money, but the money is secondary. And it is a lot. You're going to spend two years doing it. You better be sure you're going to get an apprenticeship at the end. And that's where there's a bit of a problem right now with finding apprenticeships. I've heard from some people that there just aren't the spaces for them. And I don't quite understand where the barrier is there. I remember one company in London, and I'm afraid I don't know their name right now, claimed they shut down because they couldn't find apprentices. And that just doesn't seem to be the case. Maybe they weren't paying enough or I don't know enough about it, John. Yeah, so there's kind of two parts to the apprenticeship. Number one is, and and it's a general term, but it's it's pretty close to the truth throughout all of the indentured trades is one journey person, one apprentice, five year relationship. Slightly slight variations to that. When I first got my electrical license uh, years ago, I was allowed to take on one apprentice. I did, so it would be unless we hired another journey person, it would be a five years before that person was uh, registered, and then we could bring on. Um, another apprentice. So we would be able to take on one for him and then one for me. So, you know, you've got one person working, then two people, five years later, you've got four people. And anybody that's run a business or worked at a business will tell you that most of the grief you have comes from staff. So many contractors, many licensed tradespeople that run companies will say, you know what, I'm happy working by myself. You know, me in a truck, I'll call another helper if I need somebody to help me lift something, or I'll call another contractor that can maybe is maybe a competitor to come help me with a job that's a little bit bigger and we can tag team that. So, you know, I think there's two parts to this. The one is that the ratios are very difficult. And I will say, not just because I'm in the game um, and I want to keep my competitors smaller and less nimble to compete with me, I, it's not exactly the case. But fast forward five years from now, when our housing situation is different, we have got all these indentured journey people that really don't have any work. We kind of want to trickle the water into the into the bathtub a little bit slower so that we don't create a situation where, oh, great, they sold me this journey person's ticket. And, and at the end of five years, great, I'm licensed and now there's no work because I've been around long enough to know when there was no work. And actually, that's the case right now. Right now, there's a little bit of a lull in that new housing construction market in, in Ontario. So any contractor, any electrician, plumber, sheet metal guy that's warm one that's working in that area is probably not working full time and may not be working at all for a while until housing gets back to where uh, it was historically for the last 10 years. I wanted to ask you as well about, there was a stat, this actually came out of the U.S. and the number of students enrolled in trades colleges has gone up about 16%. Construction applications at two-year undergrad programs, 12%. So they're going into shorter courses still at colleges though to get into skilled trades and there's competition colleges cry poor that they don't have you know enough students or they don't have enough money or whatever it is that's going on is that the way to do it can you go and take a couple year course at a college you still have to apprentice after that don't you you do so you know it, i would argue that you've wasted those 2 years now there are things that go on at the colleges that lead to good paying long term jobs in the construction industry so you know think about project management estimating anything to do with computer programming we have a two guys in our office now which essentially that's what they do our electrical uh, building automation side will put in all the hardware and various pieces of the HVAC and lighting equipment. And we want certain things to happen. And, you know, if it's uh, an empty room, we don't want dampers to open up and bring in fresh air because there's no need for that. We just want to heat that air and, and cool that air as needed. But if 
30 people show up, they start breathing. We want to sense the CO2 in the air. And depending on what levels they're at, we want to bring in various amounts of fresh air. And that all needs to be programmed. So, you know, in one case, the fellow is a, li- a licensed electrician. He had morphed into this career uh, by being on the tools. In the other case, this was a foreign worker, young man that came from um, Nepal, spent six months at Fanshawe College. Not sure he actually even needed to do that, but that was his gateway in through the student visa program that the government set up. And now he's uh, he programs the equipment for us and does the drawing. So when we look at the graphics, we can see, okay, the fan is turning on as it should. The CFMs that uh, we're moving around the building are the right CFMs. Our sensing equipment is doing what it should be doing. Now, that can certainly be taught in a two-year program at a college. That should, in my mind, be a lifetime uh, career choice that's valuable because AI can't – I don't think AI can do that. He has to liaise with the on-site guys in what he's doing. So what is – I mean, we talked about pre-apprenticeships and and talking about these college courses and stuff. What is a good way to sort of dip your toe in – or can you, to find out if a certain direction is right for you? You know, I think it's the old-fashioned way. I don't, you know, we, we all hear stories, maybe the younger people don't know these things, but, you know, the CEO of the company started in the mailroom and theoretically pushed the mail around, handed it out on the desk. There's probably no company that even has those jobs anymore, but we just bought a new vehicle for the company last week, and I dealt with the salesperson, and then, like a good organization, the salesperson says, I'm going to hand you off to somebody else that's going to look after the paperwork and making sure the licensing and the registration all gets done properly. Because essentially what they're saying is my job is to sell and I've already sold you. So I'm going to move you on to somebody else. So the the woman that was helping me with that, we chatted about all the various options that were available aftermarket and the various things I needed to have the, the vehicle put in the company's name, these sorts, these sorts of things. And I asked her how she got started in that job. And she was a mother of three kids, I think about five years ago when her youngest was getting ready for daycare. She started an online program. She started as a receptionist at this car dealership. And surprise, surprise, after four months, they went, whoa, okay, we've got somebody that A, shows up every day, really takes pride in their work and and is super motivated. So within four months, they moved into another position. And then, you know, a year after that, she was running the financing and administrative arm, which in my mind isn't probably the top job in the dealership, but for somebody to go from answering the telephone and transferring calls, maybe you're answering a few questions to doing what she is doing now, that's amazing. So I think the, so the answer to your question is if you cannot get an apprenticeship and you're interested in the trades, get on a construction site in any capacity that you can. And show them what you've got. Show them what you've got. A, you're going to learn, you know, I've always said the, you know, the, the people that do the framing of, of structures typically are the people that know the most about the project because they have to build the bones. They have to read the blueprints to the greatest degree. Everything has to be perfect in their measurements or there'll be problems down the road. So framing of a house, not necessarily a, a red seal trade at, at that level, but you know, you spend four or five months in a construction site doing that. Hey, you're going to find out if this work is for you because you'll be working in a couple of different seasons, you know, it's nice in the summertime until it's 30 degrees and the sun's beating down and you're, you know, you're sweating and trying to get these walls up because the, the builder's pushing you to get onto the next house or conversely, you're in the really cold days. And I suspect that with the wind that we've just had in the last couple of days, some of what got put up last week is going to have to be put back up. I got a couple of branches on my trees that are down and I suspect neighbor's fence was down. So I suspect some construction sites will need a little bit of remediation from that and as well on Monday. So I freelance in voice work and in content creation, which basically just means writing (laughs) and uh, making little memes and stuff like that. And a lot of the work in my pool has been taken over by AI or people are dabbling with AI. You know, artificial intelligence can do so many things and I could go on for a day and a half about that, but that's not what this podcast is about. One thing about having a skilled trades job is you'll you'll never get artificial intelligence to cut your hair. You'll never get artificial intelligence to build a wall or wire an electrical panel. And in that way, these jobs are kind of future proofed. Am I right on that? Yeah, um, I'd say they're, you know, they're future proof to the degree that we can see. So if I'm 20, and I need to know what is a good path for the next 40 years, I would feel comfortable looking at at trades. Somebody's going to have to not only build it, but then maintain it, repair it when it breaks, these kinds of things. And the reality is that because of the ratios and apprenticeships, 
it seems there's going to be a bottleneck always. And I don't know that that's going to change or should it, should it even change? We should, we, you know, we should limit the amount of people that can do electrical work, that can do plumbing work, or at least that are going to spend five years training to do these things, because what job skills would they have if that's all they trained for and, and the work ran out? And this is one of the issues with housing, right, is there's competition between municipalities for people. I mean, I live in a, an area of a new housing development, and they can't keep people because they don't have steady work. So, of course, somebody's going to go where they can have work every day. And there are just so many factors that come into keeping people employed. You know, as I think about this, when you get, when you get to a certain age in your career, you kind of intuitively have a sense of kind of how things go and, and kind of the way things go is it doesn't matter what career you get into. If you're a 22-year-old first entering the workforce, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. You should never assume that, okay, I'm on I'm in with a company and they're going to look after not only my paycheck every week, but they're going to have a career plan for me and they're going to make sure that I'm always working. And that is not the case. If if you think anybody's got a plan for you, you better question their motives because their plan is not good. They got a plan to keep their business going. And if, if you're here today and there's work, we'll put you to it. But construction is really no different than that. And in fact, you have to be a little bit more tactical about it. So, you know, one of the things we've decided as a company is that and we don't do new construction in the housing sector anyway, but new construction of single family homes in, you know, subdivisions where you've got a 30 by 120 foot lot and, you know, you know, your neighbors on five or six uh, sides of you, those subdivisions are not going to be built to any great degree in the future. What's going to happen is mid high rises and high rises. So the next generation of homeowners will be living in condominiums, whether they rent them or whether they own them, who knows, but the picket fence, the cutting of the grass just is not sustainable. I'm living in a microcosm of what you're saying right now. They've stopped building the single family homes and the bigger condos and they're building an apartment building and the rest can just wait or maybe there'll be a change in plans or who knows what's what's going to happen there. Yeah. Development costs are too much. We can argue about why they are what they are or, you know, why land costs so much. But the reality is that that's just not what's going to happen. So if I was a young worker these days, I would look at that sector of high rises, mid rises and say, that's where I want to get. Because instead of a builder that's building 10 houses this summer and you go from one lot to the next lot, you see a developer that's putting up a 20 story building and it's going to be a year. So you know you're there for a year. And when that project is done, or getting close to being done, you'll see where the next project is and you can make yourself available to that. Because one thing we've learned over the last 15 years is that it doesn't matter where you work, you're probably a bit of a freelancer anyway. You're going to move career uh, locations because A, it'll make sense for you, or the company just plain won't have work for you. One of the things that we keep hearing about that's going to be a boom for the construction industry is affordable housing, affordable housing programs. I mean, are we talking about cheap housing that people are going to be able to get for a nickel or what do they mean by affordable housing? I think it's a little bit of a, a catchphrase that we're into in this cycle where we say politically correct things and affordable housing is just vague enough that everybody can interpret it to be what they see their situation needing. So, you know, oh, it's going to be affordable, a.k.a. I can afford it. Well, no, probably not. And I'll just give you an example. Back in, I, you know, I was 22 or 23 and living in uh, on the couch in my, my uh, mom's and stepfather's place, thinking, how am I ever going to move out on my own? And my grandmother, who was uh, living in the East End of Toronto, was just getting to the point where she was going to go into a retirement home. And I certainly wouldn't have considered buying a house at that point. But I remember my uncle saying he was going to put the house up for sale and it was going to go for $128,000. And I went, oh my goodness, I cannot afford it. It wasn't weeks. It was probably days. I called a, a friend in London and I said, look, I went to school in London for a little bit. I know I can rent a place a lot cheaper. Maybe houses are cheaper. So one day I'd be able to afford something. And within about two months, I was here working and living in London. And as you know, prices didn't drop then as everybody said they were going to. They just consistently went up. So I think it's really a supply and demand issue. We have more people than the accommodations required for them to to be housed the way they want to be housed. So yes, we're going to continue to build houses. And virtually by flattening off that supply and demand curve, we're going to solve the vast majority of it. Now, we're not going to make everybody happy because, you know, I don't know what percentage of Canadians over time have always owned houses, but there's always been a case at a point in time when people simply could not afford a house. Their income, their value to the marketplace is another way of saying that. 
just wasn't high enough for them to be able to afford a house in the city they lived in. Right. I think there are a lot of people that have gotten left behind again. You know, there are people really struggling. They can't find a place even to rent. Like there's no community housing or not enough or public housing or not-for-profit housing and all that kind of stuff. So I think that's part of what they're talking about addressing. But for people who absolutely want to own their own home and just don't have the money to do it, I don't think this is going to stretch things for them. You know, in Europe and other places, owning isn't the benchmark. You rent, and that's perfectly fine. I think that we're starting to realize that there isn't just one way to go about your life. Uh, There's a whole bunch of them. That's absolutely right. And I mean, Lisa, in the era that you and I grew up in, I don't really remember anybody saying, John, what you want in life is you want a house to own forever. I, I somehow went that way. And most of us went that way. And I and my family didn't own a house, so we always rented. So it wasn't like I said, I want to be like my folks, because I absolutely didn't want to be like my folks, probably the polar opposite. But my daughter's husband is from Poland. And not only do they rent in Poland, but when you rent into a place, you actually get all the furniture that was there. <laughs> it's kind of common. That's the way it is. Like they move out, you move in. Like whatever dishes are there, that's the dishes you get and the couch you get. And they get the next person's couch and dishes. Seems like a really, a, you know, renting I get, but getting the furniture just seems odd, but that seems to make some sense. So, you know, and I think young people are maybe as they should being a little bit more portable than I was. I mean, I maybe as a teenager, I thought going out to the the oil rigs out West, I thought that was something that I might want to do. And it wasn't because of the money. It was because any of the stories I heard from the older guys coming back and telling us about it just sounded like it was a whole lot of fun for a young guy to go out there. Looking back on it, it was probably would have been a really bad idea for me to have gone out there. But once I came to London, I said, hey, this, you know, if I'm going to be able to make it in this world, this city is going to have everything I need and I'm sure I can do fine. Your and my vocations collide where, or, or the trades and I collide in a good way, where I voice a lot of training. I mean, there are hundreds and thousands of people who voice the exact same thing, but I I do it for certain companies or ever working at heights. I did one on safe operation of a crane, you know, all sorts of stuff that people have to watch and get 80 percent on before they can go to a certain site. And so who pays for that? Is that the employer? I've always felt that safety training, like I have to pay to have people trained on working at heights and uh, movable platforms, these kinds of things. And I feel like that's a job skill that they should have. And either they should pay for that themselves. Right. Because you carry that everywhere you go for however long. So it doesn't really benefit you in that way. It's not the cost of the training. It's, you know, if I send somebody for a day's training, it's probably a couple of hundred bucks to the training company, but it's lost wages. And there's zero obligation that they be with me for any period of time. And I don't think there's any way around this part of the training, but, you know, many of the job sites that you go on to, you need to actually be, um, it's it's a usually an hour to three hours and can be longer. I was talking to a guy that did some work in Sarnia, one of our guys, and he said it was a two-day training program for him to get into the petrochemical uh, plants in Sarnia to do what was supposed to be a four-hour job. He had to take two days of training. So... Now, in their case, they knew it ahead of time. They they built it into the price and the petrochemical industry kind of is prepared for that. But, you know, I always felt that, man, that's just putting a lot of burden on the contractors. Every job site we go on, not every, but a lot of the bigger job sites, you have to be trained just for that. And they give you a little sticker that says, OK, you're certified for the Prestran St. Thomas site. You've mentioned this a few times since I've known you, and it's showing up every day. And I've only ever hired maybe one or two people that ever worked for me and, you know, with mixed results. But how big of an issue is this? I mean, over the years, are there that many people that are unreliable that don't show up every day? Yeah. So uh, it was a term that got used. My brother used this years ago, and I, I'll credit him with saying it, but, you know, probably that's not where it came from. Um, he said he, had, he ran a small business uh, with part-time uh, high school students that worked. And he said, I don't want them coming in thinking this is a their personal ATM, which is to say, I, you know, you got to shift every Saturday, but you only show up three Saturdays a month because uh, that's all the money you need for the running shoes or the concert tickets or whatever. So I feel like there's certainly a segment of our population that looks at it like that, that I have enough money now. I'm good. If I don't feel great, I don't come in. And the reality is that every business is in a competitive environment, I would say. 
And we certainly are. Like every one of our categories of tradespeople, we have at least 100 other competitors. We're bidding on jobs. We don't get them for any other reason than we're the cheapest uh, quote. And we're always looking to find better ways to do things. And if you've got somebody in a truck and they're just not coming into work every day, you know, it's not nice, but you have to replace that person with somebody that's going to be more reliable. So the pre-apprenticeship program you were talking about, if I think about what that truly means in my company, it means that your pre-apprenticeship is your first 90 days here. That's where you show up at whatever time you're supposed to be here. We're at a work till the end of the job. And you show me that you're better than the next candidate that I'm thinking of, because really what I'm doing is putting you in the seat beside a journey person and you're going to keep that spot for five years. And I want to make sure that I made a really wise decision and 90 days is kind of the best acid test. You know, everybody can fake it for three or four days, but 88 days of coming to work on time, not a lot of people can constantly do that, especially if they're not bent towards that kind of behavior. I could not imagine not showing up when I was expected to and all that kind of stuff. But then again, I'm old school. Well, I will say that if we were to ask the people that attendance isn't great, how good their work ethic is, they would tell us just what you said. Well, I work hard and I show up and I give my best. And yeah, well, guess what? Your best is like, it's not the top 50%, it's bottom 5%. So, it, you know, it is what it is. Right. So there's never a destination. It really is about the journey. It's about the journey. And the more I think about it, actually, it's, I've said this at a couple of talks that, most things in life are rented. And by that, what I mean is you've constantly got to put in some effort, blood, sweat, and tears into it, whether it's a relationship, whether it's, you know, your health, you don't, you don't just go to the gym once and eat a healthy meal and you're there. It's kind of a thing. So what I've come to the grips with is really, if there's one skill that is the most important by far, it's your daily habits and not just what you do, but what you think. And, you know, first thing coming to think of it is, Hey, this is going to be how it's going to be. There's no easy day. If I'm doing it right, every day is going to be hard. I'm going to probably get up real early. I'm going to work as hard as I think I can. And hopefully that's hard enough to get all the things accomplished that I wanted. And uh, then wake up tomorrow and do the same thing all over again and continue to do that until such time as you can't do it anymore. for listening to the Trade Up Podcast. Next time, Brandy Ferenc, one of Canada's 100 most powerful women and founder of Fair Trade's Toolbox. Brandy has a great story and even better ideas. She'll talk to John about them. If you'd like to know more about our book, Trade Up, visit tradeupbook.ca or Amazon. And if you have feedback about the podcast or want to suggest a future guest, email John, john at tradeupbook.ca. I'm Lisa Brandt. Bye for now.